anyway, hey guys, my name is Jan, and today we are going to be talking about the best books that I read in 2023. I have reheated tea for like the third time, and uh, yeah, let's... Oh, it looks so pretty. Okay, let's get into the stuff that I read that I loved. Uh, first up, we will go with the honorable mentions. I will actually try to be quick about this. Honorable mentions for this year was basically uh, the rereads that I did. I did a whole bunch of rereads um, and I had just a wonderful time with those. I reread the Percy Jackson series uh, this year and just had a lovely time with it. I love those books so much. Um, I think Percy is hilarious. Um, I still have to read Chalice of the Gods. <laughs> this past year, just rereading the Percy Jackson series again, just reminded me how much I love that series. It's so fun. Percy is hilarious. I love him as a narrator. He's so funny and sarcastic. There's so much like heart in this series. There's character growth and development. There's, it's so awesome. And I just was reminded so much, again, how much I love these characters. And of course there's a couple of characters I was reminded again how much I hate them. <laughs> but for the most part, I just really love the majority of the characters. And it reminded me again, like, Percy's one of my favorites. And Nico is one of my favorites. I just adore him so much. There is this scene in The Last Olympian, which is the last book, that just is so freaking badass. It makes me excited. I don't know. Just such a great time revisiting that. Um, I also revisited several other books. I ended up um, rereading some of my favorite books so I could talk about them for my favorite books of all time videos. So I got to reread The We Free Men by Terry Pratchett again. I absolutely adore that book so much. Um, I did this go around. I annotated it. I actually did little drawings at the end of each chapter and I, I don't know. I just... I love that book so much and I had such a good time revisiting that. I had a great time uh, revisiting Seance Tea Party by Raymana Yi. That was an interesting one because I was rereading some gra a couple of graphic novels because I knew I was going to talk about my favorite graphic novel of all time and then I realized in between rereading these that actually the one I thought was my favorite was not and my actual favorite was Seance Tea Party which is a fun thing to discover. And I loved revisiting that again. The artwork is so beautiful. The story is so beautiful. Um, I got to reread The Shining for the 10 millionth time, which I love. I always feel like I get more out of that book every time I read it. Um, I got to revisit Small Spaces by Catherine Arden and also The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. I annotated them this time around as well. Just enjoyed the experience of reading those books again and really getting down to the nitty-gritty of why they are my all-time favorites so that was pretty great um reread the house nope the haunting of hill house reread that this year and also had just a great time with it what else did i reread animal green gables um i have now read that i've read that in the fall i've read it in the summer i've read it in the spring i think the perfect time of the year to reread it is probably the spring but it's just all around good, good reread anyway. Then I also reread for the first time ever, because I haven't touched this since um, high school, but I reread Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. And this was, I think, the big one that really got me to think, holy crap, the things that you can get out of a book many years after having read it the first time. Because we read this book in... Ah, oh, what grade was I in? It might have been 10th grade because we spent a long time on World War II in 10th grade, but I don't think it was. No. No, because I did a project. 
I think, with one of my friends on it. So I think this was either junior or senior year that we read this book. The first go around that I read this, all I saw was the humor. You know, all I saw were the humorous parts of this, the ridiculousness, the trophom trophomagorians, the little weird alien guys, and that's all I basically saw. And so it goes, like all of that. That All I saw was the funniness, and I didn't really get at the messaging behind it, the, the deep, like, sadness, the weariness, the, the anger, the stuff that's like underneath the amusement and the ridiculousness of everything. I didn't get at the deeper parts of the book overall until this go around, which is actually why I kind of, I tabbed and highlighted um, quotes and things that kind of hit me harder that I really liked. Just Wonderful, wonderful time rereading this too, and it kind of reminded me again that I do want to read more of Kurt Vonnegut's writing because I just kind of gel with it. But yeah, the year of the year of a lot of rereads. It's going to be doing, um, I'm going to be doing some more rereads this year. So hopefully, we'll continue that kind of hype of oh, this is great to revisit these books. Originally, I thought I only had so many, but then I really started going over my books again, and I think I'm going to put it at the top ten basically that I read this year. Coming in at number 10 uh, was book one, uh, The Field Guide in the Spiderwick Chronicles by Holly Black and Tony D. Terlizzi. Uh, this was a series that I did not grow up reading. I think it might have come out like when I was a teenager, maybe? I know I watched the uh, movie when I was like a teenager, I think. Maybe college, I don't know. I didn't read the series as a kid. Um, read it because it was kind of there <laughs> um, this year, and I really loved it. I think there was only like one aspect of it that I wasn't like huge on, um, and that was uh, one of the characters like extreme reactions to things in this but it's still like the first book in like a series so I imagine if those reactions were extreme there might be some explanation coming behind them later on in the series so but overall I just really loved it that thing like sucked me in I was fascinated by the story I really liked the kids that were involved in it I really liked this kind of delving into like the 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 fairy realm basically and finding like secret rooms in this creepy old house you inherit like that's just peak just some good adventurous reads for me that was the shit that I was obsessed with as a kid so like reading this made me feel like a big kid and I really loved it and I do want to track down the rest the, like the whole series at some point. I just gotta try to find the right ones because I, I want like, I want this version. I want the version that I read out of so. I really loved it. Um, like I said it made me feel like a big kid. There was some childish childhood excitement that I felt reading this even though I, I'm reading it for the first time as a grown-ass adult but I just really loved it and I also really loved that I gave me another series that I can seek out and read at some point. Uh, coming in at number nine was Call Us What We Carry by Amanda Gorman. This is a collection of poetry uh, and this is actually the first thing that I read in 2023. This has such beautiful poetry in it. Absolutely gorgeous. The imagery in here wonderful. I really liked also how Amanda Gorman played with form and played with the imagery. There are different things that she did in here. There is this which is shaped like the Capitol building. Uh, she did a lot of different poems that kind of had shapes to it. Here is one that I really liked which is shaped like a giant like fish or a whale rather. And it's in part kind of about the Essex, which was a ship that was destroyed on like um, a whaling expedition. It's a big, like, 
major wreck and everything. Um, I also really liked different things that she did here, which is like photocopied pages of like journal entries. Such a very like, this one's on a face mask, it's such a very visual thing. This very like very interesting visual things that she did in this collection which I haven't really read that many poems that play with stuff like that or I hadn't up until this point so I I really enjoyed that as something like new and something I hadn't really read a lot of before. I also really uh, loved a lot of the things that she was saying in here and there's so many beautiful lines. I have a lot of pages that I have the, the corners folded over because I loved the poem so much. Um, I have a lot of pages where I've got my favorite lines kind of marked and things like that. Just really overall wonderful. Um, I will say the toughest thing about this collection though was that it was written mostly during and uh, concerning 2020 and partially 2021 so it was basically like the pandemic and then everything <laughs> everything going on and 2020 just kind of felt <laughs> from the start of like I don't know March I guess all the way through just kind of felt like a I don't know I felt like I was in a never-ending nightmare <laughs> of just just awful um <laughs> every every which way you turn so that I will say is the one thing that maybe is what puts this collection further down on my top reads list I could not not have it on my top reads because it is such a profound and beautiful collection of of poetry and everything but at, at the same time it's like just that aspect just makes it a little bit further down on my list just because it is hard <laughs> to get through. If, you know, if you're not mentally fully there to, to deal with reading about all of that yet, maybe wait on picking this up. But, um, yeah, it's just really beautiful. And I have thought back to this collection a lot over the past several months. Even if I haven't, like, talked about it in videos, every net every so often I will be like oh yeah but what about that one part or something so this is this is definitely a collection that you'll continue thinking about later um which is what has happened to me coming in at number eight was a romance novel and it was Get a Life Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert uh, this was so stinking cute you guys this is an example of a time when the hype is for real um, this is part of, I think it's just a trilogy. I think there's only like the three sisters. I have not grabbed the other books yet um, because I am kind of hoping to get versions that look like this as opposed to the older versions, but I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, this was very cute and I, I can understand the hype for it. Um, not only is it cute, it's also wicked funny. I, my one thing about this is that it didn't quite have the trope that I thought it had just based on like what's kind of on the back and how it was marketed to me. I thought it was more like less pretend to have some kind of thing going and then it actually becomes a relationship but in reality this actually kind of started out more enemies to lovers which is not really my thing but still looking past that so cute. Not only is like the relationship between the characters just kind of cute to watch it unfold, it's very funny. Like I actually audibly laughed while I was reading this book. I really liked reading about the main characters like family and and seeing a little bit of how they interact with each other. Honestly I would love to see more of the family so I'm excited to read the other books. Yeah, I just, I really liked their developing relationship, I thought was very well done. It wasn't too slow, wasn't too quick, it was just very well done. I really liked the flaws that each of them had and this 
being part of like a, a group of romance novels that I, I found is like my thing lately. It's not that someone has issues and then it's just kind of like, but getting with this person solves all the issues. And it's like, cause that's not real life. That's not really what happens. You just, issues don't magically get away just because you're regularly having sex. Like that's not how that works. I mean, not normally anyway. But I really, I really liked that these characters are there for each other um, and that, yeah, they have like this shit going on, but it, it's not about the other person fixing it or being expected to fix it. They are there as like a supporting force while you are working on your shit and fixing it yourself. Like I really like that. I, that is something that's done in like, um, the Reluctant Royal series, which I absolutely love that series, and that was something that I felt very much in this book as well, and I really loved that. I find it refreshing, and I really enjoyed it. There's a cat in it, super cute, and ah, uh, the steamy bits were also really good. Very, very steamy, very good, and there's different parts of this which I think was good to be represented. Um, there's something involving the main male character that might be a spoiler so I won't get into it but I really liked that that representation was here and uh, the main female character has like chronic pain she lives with that and I think that this was very well done again I don't deal with chronic pain but I have a few people in my life that do um, and from what I know of that through them, I will say that this seemed to be written very well, and it was well represented, and I really liked that aspect of it too, that you're having like, hey, this is not just like a side character, this is the main character finding love and living their life, but they also happen to be dealing with chronic pain. I really liked that that was represented in this as well. So yeah, loved this. I didn't read a ton of romance novels this year, but this was definitely the best of the, the bunch of what I read. Number seven best reads this year were a couple of graphic novels, and those were Mouse, um, Volume 1 and Volume 2 by Art Spiegelman. Uh, these are two graphic novels that Art Spiegelman wrote concerning World War II and his father and mother experience as well, but it, it really focused in on his dad's story of living through and surviving concentration camps. I say that this is one of the best things that I read. This was a really hard read. Like this was genuine, genuinely a very tough thing to get through. I think parts of it felt uh, a little, I don't even know how to explain this exactly. On the one hand, it felt like this was slightly easier in some aspects to read than other books about the Holocaust that I have read before, just based upon the fact that all of the characters in it are anthropomorphic animals and the majority of them are mice and and I think that that was definitely helped by that and kind of eased some of the tough topics. On the other hand, it's also such a weird juxtaposition to see kind of cute animals on the pages and you're just learning about some pretty horrific things. The visual aspect of it was pretty hard because they will actually show like visually people dying and some shit going down so that was also wicked hard but overall I think that these were just beautifully done and it was really hard to read and I I liked that this topic was chosen by the author because this is really it's really rough and it was really close to him too because like I said he is telling his father's 
story and him and his father do not get along. So part of these stories besides the fact of him telling his his father's tale and maybe trying to understand a little bit more about why his dad is, is the way he is. The other is also like discussing his own relationship with his his dad and how they don't get along and and how and how that whole thing has gone about. So overall this felt like almost like a glimpse into uh, a diary of someone just recording some really horrific familial dra trauma. It was a lot. I will say it's not the most cheerful thing ever that you can read because it's 100% not. Um, I had a lot of feelings reading it. I, I definitely 100% uh, needed to watch a lot of funny stuff after I after I finished reading the, these novels just because I needed like a, you definitely need a breather after reading this, but I think that it's a really important thing to read. Um, I think as a graphic novel, it is, like I said, it's kind of more in your face with the visuals, but it is also like a little bit more accessible maybe than um, some other books that you could read it's a little bit quicker and it is more um, visual on top of everything but yeah I also wanted to read it majorly because there's so many people that are trying to ban the shit out of it and that blows and they are terrible that's the hill that I will die on if you ban books you're terrible tough tough read absolutely tough 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 read not the not the best thing that I've ever read but at the same time is on my best reads list because I I think it was done so well I think it was done so well um, and you can really kind of get at the the emotion that is being expressed in here as well so when I, when I say not the best I mean not the most fun reading experience I've ever had but um, definitely up there on one of the one of the best graphic novels I've read uh, just yeah very well done coming in at number six on my best reads list you know Dumas was gonna show up here um, it's the three musketeers so if you watched my videos about this this past year if you if you watched either of my reading vlogs <laughs> about it or if you watch my my overall wrap up you know that this book was more of a four on my rating scale and you know that I definitely 100% had some issues with this book so you might be asking Jen but why is this on your best reads of the year list well my friends because it's still so fucking good you guys there are definitely some elements of this book that I 100% had some problems with. The characters themselves are not so much the fun-loving, silly, honorable, crazy dudes that you see portrayed so often in movie adaptations of this this book. And normally when characters do really shitty things I get very bothered and I end up really hating them and it's just like a whole thing but with this book it, w it was crazy because even though a couple of the views that about like women and and stuff that a couple of the characters had and some the ways that they behaved and things that they did and and different things throughout I really could have gone to the point of disliking them but I just I could not I could not I ended this book still really enjoying the characters and liking them and wishing the best for them and I think that in this case, those bits of them made them more interesting. The view of them is more not just like a black and a white, they're very gray area characters. Not everything they do is above board, um, although I think for the most part 
these four chuckle fucks are trying their best. Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan, I think they are trying their best. I love this book so much. I have a Three Musketeers t-shirt. I loved this book. It is a page turner. And again, this is crazy for me to say that Dumas is a page turner because this motherfucker is so big. Do you see how big this book is? This isn't even his longest. I think his longest is Count of Monte Cristo, which is one of my favorite books. And that one's like 1,276 pages, the version that I read. This puppy is, what are you? This thing is 760 pages. So it's a big, it's a big boy. Um, such, such a stinking page turner though. I, I think a large part of that is probably because I, I believe that Dumas wrote these kind of serialized so they like came out in the chapters or in portions or something like that so you needed the action to be keeping up you needed the net people to be invested in the next section that was coming out so that makes a lot of sense but such such a page turner so exciting you really want to know what is happening with the characters there's political intrigue which again not something that i'm super duper into but man did dumas make me care about it in this freaking book like Ah, oh, so exciting. The character's hilarious. You, I wanted to find out what these idiots were going to do next. And I just loved this book so much. And it, it's not just the action. It's not just the interesting looks at how, how, how flawed, but how interesting and cool the characters are. It's the humor, it's the descriptions, it's like, it, it, it is the intrigue. It's wanting to know, oh my god, where are we going with this? And yeah, I loved it. I loved it so much. I want to read the other books in the series. I did look for uh, the second book recently and I didn't find it. Um, but I do want to track down the others. I definitely want to track down this um, translator because he did a damn good job. It's Lawrence Ellsworth. Uh, Lawrence Ellsworth. Is a, Lawrence Ellsworth is the pen name of Lawrence Schick. He's an authority on historical adventure fiction. I also want to read his other books that he's read. But he is a translator for The Red Sphinx and Twenty Years After, which are other books in the series. And then there's also The Man in the Iron Mask which is a part of the series that it looks like he hasn't translated that one but yeah just just so good you guys I know that this one's probably not as accessible as some more shorter <laughs> um classics but if you are in for a big Book. like you're looking for a chonky book and you're looking for something that's like super interesting please read this one such a page turner so action-packed so entertaining so good number five on my list was legends and lattes by travis baldry uh this book this is a sub genre that I didn't know I wanted nor needed in my life. This is, I guess, a new thing. Cozy, cozy fantasy. <laughs> um, very low stakes. Very, very low stakes. There's not a lot to be lost in this book. There's not a lot of crazy, action-packed, adventurous things happening. And I don't know if my enjoyment of that is this book is partially aided because I am slightly more picky about fantasy and especially adult fantasy having trouble finding things that I actually like. I just really enjoyed this. I didn't know I needed this in my life. I didn't know that I needed to read about an orc trying to start over and open a coffee shop in a country in a world where people don't know what the fuck coffee even is. I loved this so much. From a coffee lover <laughs> point of view, uh, from a person who has issues finding fantasy they like point of view, from a 
a found family lover. I love found family. It is one of my favorite tropes. There's so much of it in here. I love the little friendships and the little family that is created in this book when Viv is just preparing and opening her coffee shop and the people that end up just flocking around her and becoming like her her family basically I just loved that so much and I I hadn't really realized it before but over the past couple of years when I've been talking about aspects of books that I really like I didn't realize how much I enjoy reading writing about food <laughs> I didn't really think that, that was something that was such a huge thing for me but this just oh so good reading about the different pastries and the way the coffee it was just so heartwarming it made me hungry I drank a shit ton of coffee while I was reading this book I loved this so much I know that this is not really for for everyone but if you want like a cozy a little break from high stakes high stress like fantasy or something this is a good one for that it's just so chill um i've heard mixed things about the prequel but i do still plan on reading it and if this gentleman writes any more fantasy i definitely am very interested in that too because i just I really liked this little world that he created here and I'd like to learn more about it and I'd like to see more of Viv. Um, but yeah, I just, and, and the romance that starts up in here, oh my gosh, that's so cute too. So I just, yeah, yeah, I loved, I love this. It's just, like I said, it's a subgenre. I didn't know I wanted or needed, but now I definitely need more of it. So yeah, I love this. Coming in at number four, we have... Another Chonky Boy, Bleak House by Charles Dickens. This, oh man, you guys, you might be asking, why is this so high on the list? How did this get higher than Three Musketeers? Guys, this is, this is, this might be Dickens' masterpiece, man. I mean, that's alluded to on the back, like G.K. freaking Chesterton quoted this and said perhaps his best novel when Dickens wrote Bleak House he had grown up agree this so interesting and again it probably sounds confusing and kind of boring just from trying to talk about it and be like well this involves a legal case that is caught up in the courts and has been for like so many years and this is about wards of the court who are involved uh, with the case and another ward of the court who is not really involved in the case and they're all brought together by this one guy and they're just kind of waiting out the legal struggles but then it also involves like other things going on other stuff happening interconnected everybody's interconnected with everybody else it's like one of those Hollywood movies like Love Actually or something where you see the different parts of everybody's lives and they all get intermingled it's like that, but way more well thought out and way more fascinating. Like, it's just the yarn, like the yarn that would have to be pulled to connect everything out. Yo, there's, <laughs> there's just a lot happening in here. And what's crazy is you can go through and read this like I did and be like, okay, so now we're jumping ship and we're now talking about these characters. Which, that's cool, these are quirky characters, that's alright, but why are we talking about these characters when we were just focusing on these guys? And then we're coming back and we're talking about somebody else, and it's like, okay, but why is, I mean, this is interesting, but why are we doing this? And everything will come together and make sense, because like I said, everybody's story is kind of intermingled with each other, and it was like Dickens just showing you different parts of these people's lives and giving you glimpses into what's going on with them until he could pull those strands and show how everybody is interconnected from the 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 highfalutin lounges of the arist aristocracy and noble families and stuff 
all the way down to like the very poor and destitute and like how everything is interconnected within society and corruption and just like uh, just a whole bunch of shit happening and <laughs> I loved this. I I figured that I would enjoy reading more Dickens because overall I mean A Christmas Carol is one of my favorite books and I have enjoyed some shorter stories of his here and there although it has been a mixed bag because a couple of his short stories I, I'm not really that fond of but then I was like I, I knew I wanted to dive into one of his big ones and see how I felt about it and I vibe with this dude's writing so much. I just love it. I mean, sometimes there are paragraphs where I will have to read them over a couple of times because I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> He's using some very big words here that we don't really use that much of. So I need to like really reread this a second and kind of get at what you're saying. Luckily, these books all have footnotes, so you'll get the general context of things if you don't know what the hell he's going on about at the time. But then there's like just glimpses of humor. He has a lot of social commentary and then there's like humor and some of it's just in your face humor and some of it's more sly or a little bit kind of dark and just very, oh, so interesting. His descriptions are so beautiful. They suck you into a story and makes you feel like you were right there. And I think I talked about this in my wrap up maybe when I was like discussing this book, but like, it's something that I, I really love about A Christmas Carol is Stave 3, I believe is what it is, The Ghost of Christmas Present, where Scrooge is being taken around London on Christmas Day with the Ghost of Christmas Present and you really, it makes you feel like you're there. He's describing the people, the bustle, the hubbub, everything. And he's also describing the delicious scents and sights and the feelings, everything of how wonderful Christmas Day is. And that's how he makes you feel in this book too, because he's sucking you into different parts of London. And a lot of it's not really great. You don't want to be there. You really don't want to be in the cold ass slums where things smell real bad and you don't want to know what it is. Like it's, you don't want to be there, but the way he words things in the descriptions just suck you in anyway. The way he can make you care about people that you have glimpsed barely anything of but it's it's like it's so good it's so brilliant a lot of what he was trying to do in this book he's really trying to expose society and it's 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 problems it's evils it's corruption and stuff like that but and also adding in some just random really weird stuff too it's just so interesting and what grabbed me about this book was the aspect of there was like a detective and there was like a, some suspicious deaths and stuff like that going on too. And that was not, I'd forgotten that that was a part of it. It happens, stuff happens later on in the book. It's thick. But I'd forgotten that that was what drew me in initially because I was so fascinated in everything else that was going on in this book otherwise. Um, but yeah, I just... I loved this. I mean, A Christmas Carol is still 100% my favorite of his forever and always. I don't even care. But this was really damn good and it made me really excited to pick up some of his other books this year. I don't know, I just, there's something about Dickens writing that I just really vibe with and I just love it. And that's why this is higher up on the list because I just had such a good time with this book. I cried, you guys. There was a couple of parts that made me cry. Entertaining from, from start to finish, basically. That ending got me. I loved it. Then we get into number three on my list, which number three might be potentially cheating <laughs> a little bit, um, because it's actually three books in, in one, but they're all part, they're a trilogy. And that trilogy is Westmark by Lloyd Alexander. If you've been here for a little bit, you probably figured there was going to be some Lloyd Alexander on this list. I love this man. I love his writing. Uh, he seemed like he was such a damn cool dude. And 
I really, ah, oh man, I really want to read everything he ever wrote, because just so good. And this series, oh, I don't think it surpasses the Chronicles of Perdane, because I just really love the Chronicles of Perdane, but this trilogy was really good, set in the fantasy world, and one of, concerning one of the kingdoms, especially Westmark. And this has it all you guys, this has action, this has adventure, this has, um, secret, uh, secrets, secrets, political intrigue, um, funny stuff. We have people on the run, uh, we have rebels, we have evil, uh, tyrants, we have sinister advisors, we have missing princesses, we have war, the ter the ravages of war. This series just covers it all. I mean, Westmark was really good, very entertaining, really enjoyed the characters in it, loved the twists and turns in it, and then you get into the Castrol, and all of a sudden it's opened up into war, and you're learning more about war and the effects that it has on people and the terrible things that people will do because they believe that they are in the right, and because well, you gotta fight the enemy and stuff going on. It really questions things and puts everything, well, not everything is so black and white. There's a lot of stuff that are a gray area and it's just like, it really discusses that. It discusses like post-war trauma and stuff. And then you get into the Beggar Queen, which also deals with that and deals with the aftermath of things and like everything coming together. Oh my God, you guys, this was so good. I think a lot of Lloyd Alexander's life very much influenced like his his work and you can tell that a lot in his and the things that he wrote about what he felt about the Westmark trilogy and the messages that he was trying to co convey and like things that he was trying to get at but just so so beautifully done. I don't think this one is middle grade um because the characters are a little bit older. I think this series is technically for like young adult but I just it uh, was doing so many interesting things and you also get to see different points POVs throughout books which is not something that I'm a huge fan of to be completely honest but I, I really enjoyed that in here. I like seeing what everybody was up to and everyone comes together and it was such a oh it's such a good trilogy you guys. I, I loved the characters. I loved looking at the twists and turns. I love recurring people coming back and being mixed up into other things. The series made me cry. I laughed a lot. I just really enjoyed this. This had me like audibly reacting to things like shit was happening and I was going, oh no, oh no, no, no. And I, <laughs> I don't really get very audible with my reactions a lot of the time when I'm reading. Um, I, sometimes I'll laugh out loud but it's not that's also not something that happens like a ton <laughs> but this for me to have like actual like audible reactions and going no 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 <laughs> or holy shit or something like that is like unheard of so that that was something too that this made me like I was so invested within this but yeah I just it's such a good it's such a good trilogy you guys I have read what Lloyd Alexander wrote about the trilogy before. I've read this a couple of times, so I'm not going to get into it again, but he's, oh, I don't know. It's just so, so good. So much fun. Then we get into two, my second best thing that I read this year. And this was actually a close call um, because I pretty much knew back in like, I don't know, May or June what my top read of the year was, but I really had to like really think it through again and be like, am I sure? Am I 100% sure? Yes, I am. It was a close call, you guys. The number two best read of the year was Excuse Me As I Kiss the Sky by Rudy Francisco. This is a collection of poetry. I won't get a ton into it because I don't have that much. Um, honestly that much room left on my camera but also <laughs> I recently talked about this um in my November wrap-up because I read this in November 
this is such a good collection of poetry, you guys. I love Rudy Francisco. He is my favorite living poet. He does such a beautiful job, and he always does something a little bit different. He He's playful with his collections. Like, one of his other collections, I mentioned this before, was kind of like a different, like, dictionary, this, like, experience of him making up words, defining words, writing poems relating to those words. In this one, he played with form a lot. So these are more interesting forms. He did, like, free verse. He did contrapuntal. He did, like, just a lot of, a lot of different forms that he he tried in here and I not only loved these poems like his poems always feel like such a to take you on such a roller coaster of emotions one minute a poem can feel like it's a punch in the gut because of how like raw and emotional it is and then the next will make you feel so warm and comforted like you're getting a hug from a friend after a hard day it's so stinking good so beautiful so beautifully done he can also make you like laugh within his poems a couple of times I got teary-eyed because of a couple of lines in here I loved this collection so much I think I actually might like this collection more than his previous two and I loved those so much um, but I, I just loved this a lot and something else I really loved about this was that in his playing around with form and stuff in this kind he also explained the form of the poem and then he had a personal piece that he he wrote about his interpretation of that form and what it meant and his, how he wrote this piece or or why he chose it and that kind of it was so interesting to get more in like his head about his his writing process and everything as well so so good you guys so good if you want a new poet please read him he's so amazing please 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 and that brings us to my top read of the year tippy top read of the year and that was Understood Betsy by Dorothy Canfield Fisher. This is a story about a little girl who has grown up in the city. She is an orphan and yeah, she's grown up in the city with some aunts of hers and through a series of circumstances, she ends up needing to relocate for a while and she is sent to live with her Putney relatives who live up in rural Vermont. Uh, she is sent to live with Uncle Henry, Aunt Abigail, and her cousin, and I can't actually remember what her- oh, Cousin Anne. Thank you. She is sent to live with them for a little while, and at first, Bessie's freaked out. Now, Betsy is known as Elizabeth Ann <laughs> um, by her regular uh, relatives until a little bit later. Uh, but basically, Betsy is a very anxious child. Um, she is constantly living in a state of anxiety and worry. Um, and this has honestly not really been helped by her relatives that she's grown up with so far because they are also very paranoid and anxiety ridden and hypochondriacs and constantly like concerned about one thing or another and a lot of that ends up getting kind of put onto Betsy and making her feel more anxious and also because of this level of things of people being afraid that something might happen to her. She has had a lot of things done for her in her life. She hasn't really learned how to do a lot of things that other kids at this time period would know how to do or be allowed to do or responsibilities that they might have. She's never had that before. And so it's also part of her anxiety is like she doesn't know how to do anything. She's never been presented with different situations before. So the world in general that she doesn't know is kind of scary and then on top of that school is not very um, fascinating for her. She's just 
hasn't really been given the room to actually grow or do anything on her own or figure stuff out on her own or or any of that until she ends up going to stay in Vermont with her family. Her relatives are just the absolute sweetest. Like Uncle Henry and Aunt Abigail, oh my good god, just so sweet. Such a sweet couple. So heartwarming, so kind, and her cousin Anne can be a little bit abrasive, but it's not like in a, in a super unkind way of being abrasive. It's more like just being there as like someone who hopes the best for you, but instead of just coddling you, wants to just push you a little bit to do your best. Uh, she actually kind of reminded me of a couple of really good teachers that I've had over the years who it's like, they are kind, but they're also not going to hold your hand. They know that you have the potential to handle shit and they just want you to like, just kind of push you to like, you can do it. You got this kind of thing. And the idea of disappointing them is like the worst. And that's kind of how cousin Anne is too. You don't, Bessie doesn't want to disappoint her at all. She wants to learn things. She wants to be able to handle things so she doesn't disappoint cousin Anne so she can actually figure out stuff on her own and it was just so good to watch her journey from being like this very terrified timid little kid to someone who feels very independent and confident and just feeling herself basically and it was just really good to watch that and the I know it's not a found family kind of thing because they are her family, they are her relatives, but just this this family unit that they created was also so special. And I love the little descriptions of like Vermont at that time period and things. There's a one room schoolhouse that was very interesting. And I think one of the things that like was so special about this and also kind of elevated it up for me was that this little girl who is very afraid and doesn't know how to do things and everything but she's not she's never belittled for not knowing how to do things she's never made fun of for it and I think that is something that is a little bit of a downside to some of the other like children's classic fiction that I have read of the day, you know, where kids don't know how to do things or they're worried about stuff and things and then people tend to make fun of them for it or get on them about it or it becomes like this whole thing. Maybe they're punished or whatever and it's like this whole, it's just not great and what I really loved about this book was that it wasn't like that at all. Like it just wasn't. She didn't know how to do things and her family were like, they, they weren't like rude about it. They didn't make fun of her. They were just kind of bewildered because they were like, oh, you, you don't know how to do that? Oh, wow. And they're just kind of bewildered because they never heard of a kid not knowing how to like churn butter or do stuff like that because again, they're living in a rural community and Betsy grew up in like the city. So she didn't know where butter came from. It just kind of shows up you know, when the guy comes by and sells it <laughs> or is in a store or something, you know, it's not really the same. So they're like bewildered about it, but they never once like make fun of her. They never talk down to her. They're not condescending or anything. They're just like, oh, okay, well, let me show you how to do it. And then that's going to be your job. You're going to do it. And it's like, it was just this wonderful kind of way of acknowledging, okay, you don't know how to do this thing that's fine, that's totally okay, let me show you how to do it. And like praising her after she did it and like this whole thing, it was just so beautiful, basically. It was just so, I don't know, just something about it that like warmed my heart so much. And I don't know, I got, it made me all like, especially like all the 
other growth things and stuff with like family and stuff like that but I think that part especially when I was reading this kind of ended up making me a little bit emotional because I was like I don't know it felt I, I kind of related to Betsy a little bit and I kind of felt like I don't know like that healed just a little bit of like my child like heart my childhood heart that was like you know not that I was constantly like bullied or anything but I I know <laughs> from being a kid and not understanding how to do something and then like be kind of made fun of it for it kind of a situation that this just I don't know some part of it like healed my heart of like oh that's nice we we don't have to make fun of kids we can just show them how to do something and leave them to it man that's great so I don't know I just I really love that too and that was what put that up here for number one because of how like honestly how beautiful this book was the setting the characters the lessons learned the growth that Betsy has everything overall just so beautiful so well done I think this might be now my favorite like classic child get sent to live in the country story ever because it's just so beautiful so good you guys such a sweet story also interesting in general because of the way like education was talked about in here too which I guess makes sense because Dorothy Camfield Fisher was involved in like the um why do I want to call it Manischewitz oh my god am I an alcoholic um Montessori <laughs> The Montessori movement. She she was involved in that. So some of the way education is talked about in here has. I mean, it's just good to know the context of it because that's part of it. But it was just really interesting to hear that as well and how education is handled in here and it made me kind of wonder. Is like, oh, is that always how one room schoolhouse education was? handled because I I mean stuff's talked about when you read like you know Anne of Green Gables, Laura Ingalls Wilder stuff like that but I it wasn't really it didn't feel like it was gone into depth as much as it was in here which was very interesting to read about but yeah I just I loved this so much you guys if you oh man if you want to read a classic story of a little girl being sent to live in the country and learning some shit like this is this is it you guys it's so beautiful it's so good so that's it you guys that is my best reads of 2023 just really good overall I feel like this video is gonna be so long I am so sorry but I hope you enjoyed anyway um, please let me know if you read any of these books if you are excited to read about any of these books in general and yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful week, weekend, wherever you're at. Thank you for watching. Thank you for always watching. If you're new here and would like to consider subscribing, please do so. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.